Welcome to the Neuropathy Support Group and Podcast. I'm Chris, and I'm so glad you tuned in. It's my hope with this podcast to help all of us gather information that might help those that need support dealing with this debilitating issue. Hello, and welcome to this podcast. Before we get started, let's get the formalities out of the way with the medical and privacy disclaimer. I am not a doctor or medical professional. The information on this podcast is from personal experiences and is meant for group support. Additionally, the information discussed is not meant to diagnose, treat, or cure any underlying conditions associated with neuropathy. All names here within are private and will not be shared with any outside sources. Please consult your health care provider before making any health decisions. If you have medical concerns or any well, how's everyone doing out there? please contact your I doctor hope you had a great or dial nine one one. And hopefully your pain is a little bit lower than what it has been. But today we're going to be talking about fibromyalgia. And the reason we're going to be talking about this is for the next four, five, six weeks, we're going to go ahead and talk about the four uh, different types of nerve pains there are, such as peripheral neuropathy, autonomic neuropathy, proximal neuropathy, and focal neuropathy. But I thought we would uh, start off with fibromyalgia, even though it's not listed here, because it is a type of a pain, and it can be a chronic illness, and you can have it for such a long time. And that's what we're going to be talking about. We're going to be talking about the history of fibromyalgia, and we're going to get into the age range were easily um, is set at, which, I, you know, when it comes to chronic pain, I'm not really sure if there is, to me, in my mind, an age limit, but it does break it down, and we'll get started here in a minute. Let me go ahead and give you a quick rundown of my latest doctor visit. So, I saw my um, regular doctor, GP, uh, last week. And she wanted to go over the CT scans and my blood work. So I've been having issues with my stomach for some time. And I usually contribute it to the medication that I'm taking. But since she did that CT scan, because she wanted to see what's wrong with my stomach. And remember, I didn't know who ordered it. But come to find out, it was her. So she went over that and my blood work. Come to find out, I've got a lot of gallstones in my gallbladder. And she wanted to send out a referral right away to get, you know, surgery done on it. And then I'm thinking to myself, well, I still have to see the vascular surgeon. And I still got to get my MRI. When am I going to have time to go in for surgery? You know, what if the vascular one wants to go in and do, you know, his procedure? So I said, no, let's put it off right now. But I figured uh, uh, yesterday I went ahead and called them and told the doctor to go ahead and set it up. And I'll try to work it in there somewhere. So that was the issue that I was having. I still have my vascular uh, doctor visit coming up in July here. And my MRI is in July. So when I get updates on those, I'll let you know. So let's go ahead and dive right in here to the history of fibromyalgia. This is a note from the, doc- from the author. One day, many years ago, I was scouring through my grandmother's recipe cards. And I found a receipt from December 26, 1977, for two books. One's, one was called Vitology, and the other I couldn't make out the words on the yellow slip. She had paid eight ninety five for this book. In 1977, that was a, a, a substantial amount of money for a book about health and what they knew about living well in 1899. I set out and acquired the reprint reprint of this book in 1995. My favorite excerpt from this book is the following, Vitology 1899 by E. H. Reddock, M.D. The Lord never intended that man should be sick any more than he wished him to starve. But he did not give him food directly, nor perpetual health without effort. He did give him a fruitful earth and a belly to make that 
first yield food in plenty, and he gave him a mind wherewith to study and learn how to preserve his health indefinitely. Only mankind has worked so much harder to make the yield, the earth yield all sorts of material luxuries that he has neglected until this latter days to study his own power of getting well and keeping well. So the history of fibromyalgia starts somewhere near the 19th century. Symptoms began to be reported by the 60s, and by 1977, it was coined fibro fibrotisis syndrome. Common group of patients, mostly middle-aged women, who had high levels of pain, multiple complaints, sleep disturbances, psychiatric symptoms, and a general decrease threshold to pain for stimuli. Such patients are common in general medicine and represents about 2% of the general population. Scientific investigations of fibromyalgia first began in the early 1980s, and at this time, fibromyalgia was variously proposed as a psychiatric disorder, or a muscle disorder, a sleep disorder, and a generally hyper-irritable state. Let me notice that doctors always go to throw in that psychiatric one, you know, and they throw that into everything. So the stigma came to fibromyalgia patients in the 1990s, when the criteria for the illness were publicized in diagnosing fibromyalgia. The biggest argument was that the symptoms correlated with varying other syndromes and illnesses, such as chronic fatigue syndrome, irritable bowel syndrome, headache syndromes, and multiple chemical sensitivities, and many more. When it comes for myself, when it comes to the chemical um, sensitivities, all my life I've been working in the paint industry, uh, not painting houses, but selling the paint to the contractors. And our hands were in thinners, like paint thinner, lacquer thinner, denitrate alcohol, you know, and in the paints themselves all the time. And, you know, I never knew what could absorb into my body. Maybe this was the issue, but I checked it out, and fortunately, it wasn't. So, that's how we came to the point that it was neuropathy with all the tests that she ended up doing, the doctor. Then there was the all-in-your-head argument of it being a psychological illness. There you go. Patients were labeled with so sodomoform pain disorder or affective disorder by psychiatrists. The difference between now and then is the science has evolved from 1899, 1977, 1990, and where we're at into 2023. Can you believe that? How many years it took for them to find the difference? Ugh, unbelievable. They figured out that fibromyalgia is a real problem. A pain attacks not only our minds, but it has a physical effect. Damage on our central nervous system. They know that it is a gut brain affiliation, along with a vascular affiliation and an immune affiliation. Whether it was from traumatic, traumatic brain injury, or gastrointestinal injury, or nervous system damage, that we have to keep searching for better ways to help patients out there. So let's go ahead and dive right in to the main topic today. At what age does fibromyalgia typically develop? Fibromyalgia can occur at any age, but is most commonly diagnosed in middle age. Fibromyalgia is a chronic condition characterized by widespread pain coupled with other symptoms such as fatigue, sleep disorders, and cognitive issues. It is common, affecting about 2% of adults in the United States. While fibromyalgia can develop at any age, most people with the illness develop symptoms between the ages of 30. So what is the, what is the average age to get diagnosed with fibromyalgia? Most people are first diagnosed with fibromyalgia 
in their 30s or 40s. While fibromyalgia is a chronic disease, it's not a progressive one, so it won't necessarily worsen over time. Studies looking at the influence of age on health and well-being in people with chronic illness have produced mixed feelings and findings. See, and that's the issue. You know, I've seen my friend progressively get worse. And, you know, so I don't know. I think maybe the, the test should have... I don't know if they did a group test or just a single test, but I think it, it all works out differently for other, you know, certain people. However, one study published in 2002 found that some aspects of fibromyalgia may become less severe with age. Still, in some cases, fibromyalgia symptoms may worsen with age due to the, due to the development of other health conditions, such as osteoporosis or age-related changes in the body. For example, the body's natural ability to heal itself and regulate the immune system may decline with age, which could contribute to worsening symptoms. So what, the, what age does fibromyalgia peak? There is no specific age at which fibromyalgia peaks, as the severity of symptoms and the course of the condition can fluctuate over time and may worsen or improve at any age. Can you get fibromyalgia at any age? Fibromyalgia can occur at any age, including children, but it's most commonly diagnosed in middle-aged adults particularly women. What is the youngest age to be diagnosed with fibromyalgia? Fibromyalgia is rel relatively uncommon in young people, but it can occur in adolescents and even younger children. In general, a fibromyalgia diagnosis is younger, in younger individu individuals can be challenging due to the overlap of symptoms with other conditions such as growing pains and depression. And the re limited research on the condition in uh, pediatric populations. So th there is limited uh, research been done on that. So what are usually the first signs of fibromyalgia? The first signs of fibromyalgia vary from person to person, but common symptoms may include widespread pain, fatigue, morning stiffness, cognitive difficulties, sleep disturbances, headaches, digestive issues, and mental health symptoms. Fibromyalgia can be a chronic and sometimes debilitating condition. It's not considered life-threatening illness and doesn't typically affect your life and how long you live. However, it can have significant impact on a person's quality of life and daily functioning. So let's go ahead and talk about some treatments. Fibromyalgia is a chronic pain condition that can be challenging to treat, as it can cause a wide range of symptoms and may have multiple underlying conditions or causes. There's currently no cure, and treatment generally aims to manage the pain and other symptoms. Treatment Treatment typically involves a combination of medications, lifestyle changes, and other therapies that are tailored to the individual's specific symptoms and needs. Medications for uh, fibromyalgia may include OTC pain relievers, which is over-the-counter, and that would be such as NSAIDs, you know, but that's only for mild to moderate pain. You have your antidepressants, which are commonly used to help manage pain and depression, which I've never had them help with the pain before, but the next is skeletal muscle relaxants. These help with uh, the relieve the muscle spasms and improve your sleep. Next is the anti-epileptic agents. Some of these medications help with seizures, such as gabapentin, and pregalabin, but you know what, those, I used to take gabapentin, it wasn't for that issue, but I used to take it, and it never worked for me in regards to my, for, uh, for uh, my neuropathy. However, 
Evidence suggests that only a small number of people with fibromyalgia experience substantial symptom relief with medication. Mm, I don't know about that either. But other treatments may also include exercise, massage therapy, physical therapy, acupuncture, cognitive behavioral therapy, cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia, moving med meditation like yoga, tai chi, and finally, good sleep hygiene. The bottom line is fibromyalgia is a chronic illness characterized by widespread pain, fatigue, cognitive issues, and sleep disturbances. The condition can develop at any age, but it's more common in middle age and older adult, adults. If you have fibromyalgia, it's important to work closely with your healthcare provider to develop an individualized treatment plan that addresses your specific symptoms and needs. Next article we're going to talk about is fibromyalgia diagnosis. Fibromyalgia is a chronic health condition that involves widespread pain throughout your body, tenderness in certain areas, and fatigue. It can be difficult for your doctor to diagnose fibromyalgia. There are no lab tests or imaging tests available for it. Instead, your doctor will ask you to describe and rate your symptoms. Remember, when you go into your doctor, don't tell him, you know, you need to give it with affirmative um, voice and message. You know, you need to let him know these are the issues. And don't let him say, well, it's all in your head. If that's the case and he's not going to do anything, go find another doctor. A number of other conditions can have similar symptoms as fibromyalgia, including HIV, AIDS, Lyme disease, certain types of cancers, degenerative diseases of the spine, and hypothyroidism. Now this one I could agree, this I'm going to agree with here only because of my neuropathy and how long it took until I got figured out that that was my issue. But listen to this. Your doctor can use clinical tests to rule out many of these conditions, but doing so takes a lot of time, effort, and money. According to the National Fibromyalgic and Chronic Pain Association, it takes an estimated five years on an average for a patient with fibromyalgia to get a proper diagnosis. I'm going to say it took me about three years. So if you can imagine three years in pain, but it wasn't like the pain that it is now. I would say it's probably in the fives or sixes back then. And this is back in 2004 when I started feeling the onset of the issues. But, you know, it, it does take a while. Um, Pornography might be a little easier because you do have, you know, the nerve conduction tests and there's some other things that they can figure it out. But, you know, that's the thing, you know, you need to step it up and get them to run whatever tests you can run. Um, but with, but with uh, fibromyalgia, it can be difficult to diagnose, like they said here. What are the diagnostic criteria for fibromyalgia? In, uh, according to those criteria, you have fibromyalgia if you meet the following three conditions. You have a widespread pain index on a score of 7 or higher, and a symptom severity scale score of a 5 or higher, or have a WPI score of 3 to 6 and an SS score of 9 or higher, or you have experienced symptoms at a similar level for the last three months and you don't have another disorder that could explain your symptoms. Before these criteria were adopted, doctors used a tender point system to diagnose fibromyalgia. Under the old system, you needed to have widespread pain, as well as tenderness with pressure was applied to at least 11 out of 18 points on, the, on your body. Over time, experts realized that many doctors didn't know how to check for tender points, or the doctor refused to do so. Plus, the older system didn't account for many symptoms that have since been recognized as key features of fibromyalgia, like fatigue or depression. Researchers believe the new system is a better way 
for diagnosing fibromyalgia. You know, luckily with me, I went through several doctors, but then I found one that she did the most thorough test you can think of. And one of them was were to find out if I had, was diabetic, because that could have been the starting point of my neuropathy and no telling how long I was diabetic. I mean, imagine up to 2004 that it all started then with my pain and until now, you know, I think it took about two or three years, like I told you, for the final, de you know, the final diagnosis. But yeah, she started out with a, te a blood work and that's where she found that I was type 2 diabetic. So that complicated everything and started the whole process of where I'm at now. So I'm a little over time right now. I'm into this 20 minutes, but I do want to uh, go over some questions and answers real quick before I let you go. Now, uh, the first one is, how do I know if I suffer from fibromyalgia? Um, you do if you have chronic widespread pain throughout the body or at multiple sites. Pain is often in the arms, legs, head, chest, abdomen, back, and buttocks. People often describe it as an aging, burning, or throbbing, fatigue, or an overwhelming feeling of being tired. See, and there's another question here. What can be mistaken for fibromyalgia? And they list here such as rheumatoid arthritis, Lyme disease, polymyelia, and lupus, which I've also... Um, have seen somebody that deals with lupus and that again is a is a real painful uh, condition too chronic pain and there's another question somebody else can an mri show signs of fibromyalgia and it says here it's unlikely that you'll need an mri for a diagnosis of fibromyalgia or chronic fatigue syndrome unless a particular set of symptoms is similar to that of neurological illness that requires evaluation with an MRI. So it's pretty much like neuropathy, you know. We were able to uh, be tested with a nerve conduction test, so that's you know, helps us out, but I'm sorry that there's nothing that you guys can do to find out if you have it. It's a long process, I guess, to diagnose. And finally, this last uh, question, is what is the root cause of fibromyalgia? Fibromyalgia is often triggered by an event that causes physical stress or emotional stress. Possible triggers include a serious injury, such as uh, after a car accident, an infection, such as Lyme disease. Sorry, I just found one more. Why is fibromyalgia not taken seriously? Unfortunately, fibromyalgia is still a somewhat controversial diagnosis because it's not yet fully understood and its symptoms can overlap with other conditions. Some people even say that it is a garbage can diagnosis that can only be given when no other one can be made. Ugh, I'm sorry, you guys. <laughs> but... There's still a lot of other chronic pains out there that hurt probably more or less than fibromyalgia does. And we need more uh, scientific work done on these issues to better help us have some kind of relief, you know, in our lives. It's just a debilitating chronic issue and illness. So you guys, Thank you very much for being here today with me. Thanks for listening. I really appreciate it. And don't forget that I will let you know as I go along here with my um, doctor results. I'll let you all informed about what's taking place. But until then, you guys, try to get some sun. Try to go out. Try to put your mind and take it off of your pain. Even read a book. Or just relax, you know, try to do as much as you can to relieve the pain and have a better week. But until then, I will talk to you next Monday. Bye. As we come to a close, 
It's my hope this podcast and other sources, such as product reviews that I have discussed today, can better our lives and give us some relief dealing with neuropathy. This episode plus others are posted every Monday on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, iTunes, Spotify, and Stitcher. And finally, whatever life throws at you, even if it hurts you, just be strong and fight through it. Remember, strong walls shake, but never collapse. Talk to you next Monday.